Well, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's my great pleasure to speak here. And uh, well, where's my laptop? Somewhere? Uh, let's see. Ah, it moves. Very good. Um, I don't know where it is, but um, well, it works wireless. So I would like to, to speak on bubbles. And what you see here is a rising bubble um, from the side. Perhaps you can make it a little bit darker, then the contrast is better. And you see that it spirals up, which is pretty remarkable. Um, once you think about it, because once you have a ball, it falls down straight. Um, and the first one who realized this was Leonardo da Vinci, um, and he made this drawing here, which you see here, of a rising bubble, and he really wondered why this is happening. And meanwhile, we have done this experiment. Here you see um, the uh, vortices behind the rising bubble, which in fact cause uh, the spiraling. I won't go into this problem uh, too much, um, because there are even more simpler bubbles as compared to a rising bubble, and these are bubbles which are trapped, trapped uh, with, uh, within the sound field, which you see here. Um, it's acoustically trapped, and the bubble is oscillating. Uh, it's oscillating with a frequency of 20,000 um, hertz, and once uh, it's collapsing, once it's getting smaller, it emits a pulse of light. 20,000 short pulses of light, and this is pretty remarkable because sound energies are in the range of 10 to minus 12 electron volt per molecules, whereas light energies are in the range of 1 electron volt per molecule. So you have an energy focusing factor of 10 to the 12, 12 orders of magnitude, and this indeed is remarkable. So we explained this phenomenon about 15 years ago in great detail, uh, and from that, understood bubble dynamics. So we didn't have any application in mind those days. We simply wanted to understand how this energy focusing is possible. And what happened after that is that starting from this subject, many, many other subjects uh, turn up, snapping shrimp, inkjet printing, nanofluidics, drug and gene delivery, and I think I'm, I must know where the computer is to have better connection. So. Um, impact uh, on liquid and sand and ultrasound diagnostics. So I would like to give a brief introduction to all these subjects um, and to show what we learned from understanding the single bubble. So first of all, the snapping shrimp. This is an example for bubbles and cavitation in zoology. Um, so here you see the animal, um, and uh, it's about five centimeter large, and there's this huge claw here on one side, uh, and it's very noisy. So um, it, the noise, in fact, is so violent uh, that it disturbs underwater communication. This animal is not very popular with the military, um, first of all because of uh, disturbance of communication, but also foreign submarines use the colonies of the shrimps to hide, uh, and uh, therefore uh, military really hate this animal. So, but what to do about it, and why is this animal doing it, and how is it doing it? What people thought in zoology is that this is thanks to some mechanical vibration. So once the claw is closing, um, you would have some vibration uh, on the claw. Uh, and I had my doubts about this hypothesis, so what we did is that we plucked this animal, put um, some hydrophone next to this into some high-speed camera, and measured and correlated both the sound uh, and uh, the optical images. So what you see here is a sound track with a peak here and a prominent peak right here. Um, and when you correlate this to the images, you see that the claw is closing, uh, water is pushed out, and you get a bubble. The reason for this is that the closure happens so quickly that uh, the jet velocity is typically 30 meters per second. This is enough to reduce the pressure to such a degree that a bubble can emerge. And what you see, once you correlate uh, the bubble um, images and the sound, is that the, once the, the claw is fully closed here, uh, hardly any sound, but the prominent big sound peak is right here at bubble collapse. So what we hear is, in fact, uh, the collapse of a bubble, the sound emission at the collapse of the bubble. Uh, and this is remarkable. You can model this along the line with which we uh, model single bubble somnescence. So here we model the reduction of the pressure. Here's the response of the bubble. And 
Um, this describes the data very well, and right here, uh, the sound is emerging. The question, of course, remains, why is this animal doing it? Uh, and here, animal gives the answer itself. So here it comes, and here uh, some little shrimp comes, right here, into the picture. Um, and, uh, well, this animal was hungry, and what it's doing is that it lets the bubble collapse very close to the shrimp, and then a shock wave is emitted from the collapsing bubble, which is uh, strong enough to kill or stun the prey, and then it's eaten up. So it's really an acoustical weapon. <laughs> uh, it's a pretty remarkable uh, way to, to make use of bubbles in nature. Um, and I wanted to show other things where bubbles are important, uh, not only in nature, but also in technology. And I come to inkjet printing, and we have heard about this earlier this morning on inkjet printing. Um, Piezo acoustic inkjet print printing is very similar to single bubble luminescence in the sense uh, that you have a channel connected to some piezo which is oscillating. In fact, at very similar frequencies, 20,000 hertz. Um, and typically 20,000 times um, uh, per second, a droplet is pressed out. Here you see the ink. Um, droplets are typically 15 microns in radius. It can also be used for 3D printing, this, this type. And once it works nicely, uh, it jets like this. This is uh, photographed with a camera from 1 million frames per second. Uh, and this is how it should work and how it works in many, many cases. But uh, sometimes it goes wrong. And this is what you see here. Here it goes wrong. Here it recovers on the left and on the right it doesn't recover. And the only way to make it recover is a solution which I call the Microsoft solution. So what's the Microsoft solution? Well, the Microsoft solution is turn off the device, wait a minute, <laughs> <laughs> turn it on again. So and you, will, you will see in a minute uh, why this is happening. So, uh, well, how to cope with this problem? Well, you cope with this problem by um, listening and watching. Um, so you uh, watch and listen. It's a good way uh, to cope with problems anyhow. And what you find is that the cause of the failure is a bubble which is entrained in the nozzle. And you see the correlation here. So here you see the distortion with droplet 28, 29. Here is the uh, signal minus the reference signal. So here no distortion. And right here you see a distortion. So you really can hear when things go wrong. And now you also understand uh, why you must wait um, to get rid of the problem. You see the bubble, which is entrained. The bubble is growing. Uh, and in fact, it can grow to such a degree that it fully blocks the sound wave. Uh, and uh, then you see here, and when the sound wave is coming, uh, no ink is jetted out, but the sound is used to compress the bubble. Um, and uh, before the bubble is dissolved, it takes about a minute, and this is the minute which I mentioned before. Um, so this was a bad way for bubbles to interact with technology. Um, let me also mention a good way. Uh, this is ultrasound diagnostics. It's a beneficial way for bubbles in medicine. So all of you will have seen images and movies of this uh, type, ultrasound imaging. Uh, but the contrast is not particularly good. And what you can do is that you can enhance the contrast by adding bubbles. So here's a hard chamber um, without bubbles. And you enhance the contrast considerably by adding bubbles. This is what you see here. Uh, and if there are more medical doctors in the audience, and I know there's at least one, uh, then you will recognize that the infarct has taken place here. Without the bubbles, you can't do it. And the reason is that these bubbles act as uh, ultrasound scatterers. Um, so the bubbles are included here. I, I think I really need the computer here. This, is, this uh, curtain is blocking it. I can't move anymore. So um, here you see the bubbles. Uh, they're coated with um, some polymer, and they oscillate. And as they oscillate, they reflect the sound. Um, so uh, yet another application of bubbles is to use them for needle-free injection uh, with the help of very, very fast jets. So um, here you see what we do. We have a capillary here. In the capillary, we focus the laser. And what's happening then is that the laser 
It creates a vapor bubble. The vapor bubble is growing, emits a shock wave similar to the shrimp, which also uh, creates a bubble which emits a shock wave. And the shock wave hits this meniscus, uh, and you have a flow focusing effect leading to this jet. Um, and um, here you see it once more. The jet velocities can go up to 1,000 meters per second, which is just remarkable. I remember the speed of sound in air is 330 meters per second, and here you achieve up to 1,000 meters per second. It's really very, very violent, and um, you can do something with it. So you can do something for this for needle-free injection. Um, so there are existing methods for needle-free injection where you have a diffusive jet, which has lots of problems, including generation of pain. But with our new method, where we have this very strongly focused jet, uh, you uh, have many, many advantages. Um, namely, you have very, very high velocities. You have uh, focusing. Uh, I mean, the jet is sharper, in fact, than the needle of some mosquito here. Um, and nonetheless, you get a sufficient liquid into the body. Um, and uh, the body, well, uh, some barrier, is the skin, and what we tried is whether the jet will be violent enough to go through skin. Uh, and we got some skin from Leiden, uh, some real skin, uh, and uh, here we see in the next movie um, that uh, the jet indeed goes through the skin. So here the jet is coming, going through the skin right here, into the tissue, which here is replaced with gelatin. Uh, so it's really very uh, nice and very new method uh, to apply drugs or vaccines uh, into the body. So um, you may wonder what's happening if, if you want to go to even higher velocities. I mentioned 1,000 meters per second, but you um, may wonder what is the threshold? Why can't you go to 2,000 to 10,000 or so? And uh, any guesses why this is happening? So here we tried with more laser energy to have a bigger bubble. <laughs> and it goes wrong. So here the um, event is so violent that the capillary is broken. So sometimes experiments go wrong. So. Uh, well, let's come to impact. At impact, droplets also play a role. Uh, what you see here is the impact of a drop on paper. Uh, it leaves a certain pattern. Once we go to another surface um, on cotton, you see that the splash pattern is very different. Uh, let me go back. I mean, I think I really need to know where my computer is, sorry. It just doesn't work. I think it's here. Ah. I don't know. So let me try whether it works better here. So on cotton, it's better. So I'm closer to my computer. Um, so uh, you see the splash is very different here. Um, and you wonder why? Well, the reason is the different um, uh, substrate uh, and the interaction between the liquid and the substrate. Uh, and the, the liquid which is used here is, is in fact blood, and we did some study for the Dutch Forensic Institute. Um, so here is another example for impact of a droplet, and you see a, a bubble is entrained. Bubbles can be very, very important at impact. Um, and, uh, well, here has higher velocity, and you wonder why. Um, and uh, it has only been found out recently. The parameter space of impact is huge. Velocity matters, diameter, viscosity, surface tension, roughness of the surface, temperature, and air pressure. It's very remarkable that air pressure matters. In former years, people made theories on impact without uh, considering air at all. Uh, but however, uh, there's a big difference. So here you see impact of a droplet on a surface um, under one atmosphere, so with air. And once you take away the air, um, you see very different behavior. So here you had a splash, whereas here on the right-hand side, you don't see uh, a splash at all. So why is this coming? You see that indeed uh, air is crucial for the, crash, uh, for the splash generation. Um, and the question is, why? How come? What happens is that the bubble is deforming thanks to the air pressure buildup under the bubble. What happens is that a dimple forms, uh, and this dimple here um, is the region of enhanced pressure, 
and the pressure wants to escape the air, so it goes to the side, creates some air stream uh, which interacts with the droplet, uh, causing the splash. And the question is now, how large is this dimple, and can one do something about this? Uh, and we developed a method to look into this dimple. This is uh, ultra-high-speed color interferometry. Um, and what we do is, if we look with light uh, at the bottom, of, uh, from the bottom, and we get a reflection of the light at the glass air interface and from the air droplet interface, and you get some interference pattern. Uh, and from this interference pattern, uh, you um, can extract uh, the uh, size and the width uh, of this dimple. So here you see it again and again, side view and bottom view. Um, what you see is that the touchdown happens at a moment when this uh, interference pattern vanishes, and this is very late. So from the side view, you think that the touchdown had happened for a long time. In reality, it only touches down very, very late, and then this capillary wave is triggered. Um, so out of this, we extract the profile, looks the scale. This is microns and this is millimeters. So it's a tiny, tiny bubble. Uh, and um, we wonder now when is the bubble maximum. Um, and here you see the relative size of the bubble as compared to the drop size, where there's the velocity, given here in dimensionless ways and here in the dimension. And you see that there's a maximum. So we have two regimes. Um, we have a capillary regime to the left, and we have an inertial regime to the right, and in between the bubble is maximum. So it's a very simple question. We have a drop falling on a surface, a bubble is entrained, and we wonder when is this bubble maximum. Uh, once the velocity is very small, the capillary forces keep the droplet together, and you don't get any entrainment. Once uh, the velocity is very, very large, right here, uh, the inertial forces dominate, you get a splash, and then also uh, there's no impact. But in between, we have the optimum. And for many, many applications, this is very, very crucial. Inkjet printing, often you don't want to have such a bubble. But for paint, uh, you sometimes want to have a bubble uh, entrained at the droplet because the optical properties are then better. Uh, for immersion lithography, bubbles are also very, very bad. So it's good to have a fundamental understanding of this type of uh, features. Uh, let me close with impact on sand. Okay. Well, then, then I, I won't tell you an impact on sand. Uh, <laughs> but um, but I uh, wa hope that I have made clear uh, that uh, bubbles are fascinating, that they are uh, acting and relevant both on a nano scale and also on an astrophysical scale uh, as, as here, and that from fundamental research you can move towards applications often in a very random way, but in an interesting way. Thanks for your attention.